Well, good morning. It is a joy uh, to be with you this morning, even if it's only electronically. And I trust, again, God will bless the word of God uh, to your hearts today. So I'd like us to read, please, from 1 Corinthians and chapter 2. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to read from verse 6 down to verse 16. And I want to particularly think this morning about the revelation of God, God revealing himself uh, to us and how he did that. And so particularly, uh, we want to consider that topic. So beginning in verse 6, it says, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? we have the mind of Christ. And again, may God bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. The early chapters of 1 Corinthians, the apostle is seeking to deal correctively with a couple of traits that were found in the Corinthians. Uh, one was that they placed great confidence in men. They had their heroes that we might call them influencers today. And they gravitated to these men and tended to put them on a pedestal and elevate these men. And it's an, always a dangerous thing to do that because the best of men are men at best. And of course, they're men uh, that they elevated. Some said that we're of Paul, some of Apollos, some of Cephas, and some of Christ in an exclusive sense, uh, that you're not part of that group. And so uh, there's this great emphasis on these heroes and, and men. And then secondly, they were enamored with Greek philosophy or the wisdom of this world or the wisdom of this present age. Things are very much like they were in Corinth in our culture. It's the age of the personality cult. Uh, even within the church, uh, there are personality cults that people seem to gravitate to. Uh, they're men that they love and they like. Uh, there's also a fascination with human wisdom, and I would say the human wisdom of this age, King James puts it beautifully, science uh, falsely so-called, and that would include things like uh, evolutionary theory, psychotherapy, all of these things that uh, it seems like the word of God is not sufficient. We, uh, we, we have to somehow bring it in line with this great knowledge of the age, this knowledge of the world. However, I would say, uh, just uh, to mention this, that I feel that the, the, the world's wisdom has never looked more bankrupt than it does right now. In a culture that can no longer define what a woman is and is confused over simple issues like gender, uh, it tells us that the wisdom of this world is absolute foolishness. And why would we be enticed or enamored with that kind of wisdom and the wisdom of god is much more sobering much more wonderful 
couple of scriptures that I want to just mention that we have to bear in mind as we look at this text today that are key in these early chapters of 1 Corinthians, given us an idea of, of why uh, he's dealing with these topics. One is 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. He says, These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So just this idea, learning not to think of men above that which is written. That was part of their problem. They elevated men. They, they extolled men. And really, uh, it's an, a, a kind of an idolatry. God is the one who's to be extolled and honored. But they had uh, done this, uh, this deed. They, had, uh, they were thinking more highly of men than they should. Chapter 2, verse 5. Again, just similar idea that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's not be those that are taken up with the wisdom of men. Now, I'm going to give you an outline to the section we've read from chapter 6 uh, down to verse 16 that we're going to be following this morning. I'm going to give you the outline now because I might get excited when I get going and forget to mention it. So I want to do it now so at least I've got it out of the way. And so, uh, first of all, verses 6 through 8 is God's wisdom is not recognized by this age. Uh, this age, for all its so-called wisdom, doesn't get the wisdom of God. It's not recognized by this age. Verses 9 through 11. God's wisdom is only known by the Holy Spirit. The only way that we can know the wisdom of God is by that revelation the Spirit of God gives. So God's wisdom is known only by the Holy Spirit. Verse 12 and 13 is how we can receive this wisdom. And then verses 14 through 16 is a comparison between the natural man and the spiritual man. So that's the, the path we're going to be taking uh, in our uh, time together. And so, first of all, we want to think about the fact that God's wisdom is not recognized by this age. So verse 6, it says, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. In the first five verses of the chapter, he's been talking about the gospel message. And he is telling us that the gospel message owes nothing to human wisdom. Paul certainly didn't use it in his presentation of the gospel. We see it in verse one, when I come to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. And so it owes nothing to, to human wisdom. But it doesn't mean that both Paul's gospel ministry or uh, his teaching ministry were devoid of wisdom. It's, it's the fact that they were, he wasn't using the wisdom of this world. And so it's not that there's no wisdom, but it's not the wisdom of the world. That's what he wants us to know. The gospel message owes nothing to human wisdom. But it's not devoid of any kind of wisdom, but it actually embodies fully the wisdom of God. And so when Paul preached, what he was depending on, what he was presenting was God's revealed wisdom, not the wisdom of the world. Paul did not want to cater to the Corinthian love of human wisdom. And yet there's a wealth of divine wisdom in that which he teaches. In fact, he says, how be it we speak wisdom? And it's among those that are perfect. Now, that word perfect, it speaks of those that are mature, of full age, uh, contrasting to babes. Uh, like in chapter 3, verse 1, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual, but to carnal, even to babes in Christ. And so it's, it's speaking of maturity, particularly, that he has in view. And so we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or those that are mature yet not the wisdom of this world again the thing that the corinthians love see immature people such as babies uh, they're people but they're immature they don't have much discernment uh, they don't know what's good for them and what's not good for them 
And uh, if you let a baby go on a floor, it'll put anything in its mouth. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a piece of coal or, or whether whatever it is, it'll go straight in there. It has absolutely no discernment whatsoever. And so uh, the, the immature person doesn't really uh, grasp the wisdom of God like they ought to. But he says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, the mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor are the princes of this world. So again, he's, he's telling us it's not the, the wisdom of this world that he is speaking of uh, or, or of the princes of this world. They have their wisdom, uh, their own particular type of wisdom, but that's not what he speaks. And by the way, he tells us, and I think this is a very uh, thrilling verse, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. <laughs> it's good to know, isn't it, that uh, the, the princes of this world and all their schemes and all their plans and all their agendas will ultimately come to nothing. Uh, the world economic foundation and all of these men with all these schemes that uh, they seem to know uh, how to tell us how to live and they seem to know uh, that we'll own nothing and be happy and all the rest of it but their schemes and plots will ultimately come to nothing praise god for that and what we're believing is the permanent enduring wisdom the wisdom of god uh, that believing this wisdom this will carry on into eternity rather than the wisdom of this world, which will come to nothing. So it says, not of the prince of this world that come to naught. But we speak, verse 7, the wisdom of God, as opposed to the wisdom of this world or the prince of this world. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And so the wisdom that he is referring to is called a mystery. Things that were hidden in ages past, but have now been revealed. And by the way, uh, one of the things that a mature believer should know is the mystery doctrines of the New Testament. Uh, there, there are some wonderful mystery doctrines, the mystery, mystery of the rapture. Behold, I show you a mystery. Uh, the fact that we're, uh, we're not all going to sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. What a wonderful mystery has been revealed to us by the Spirit. We couldn't work it out any other way. It's, it's a divine revelation. comes to us by the Spirit. Uh, the mystery of the church, uh, hidden in previous ages, Jew and Gentile in one body. Uh, the great mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. These great mystery doctrines that are just marvelous things. And so he says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, things that had been hidden in previous age, but now revealed. And oh, how we need to teach these mystery doctrines of the New Testament. But people know the great things that God has revealed to us, wonderful truths, eternal truths, but had been hidden in ages past and yet now revealed. Yet these great mysteries are still hidden to the unbelievers they don't they don't know these things they don't get these things they don't make any sense to them just look back at matthew 11 just for a second keep your finger there but i want you just to look at a couple of verses in matthew 11 and verse 25 and 26 matthew 11 verse 25 and 26 at that time jesus answered and said i thank thee o father lord of heaven and earth because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes even so father for so it seemed good in thy sight and isn't it wonderful that to actually begin to get access to these great mystery doctrines you've got to become like a little child and be converted unless you become like a little child unless you're converted we'll never know these things the wisdom of the world can't figure them out so he says in verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, this is just a marvelous, marvelous verse. First of all, he mentions the princes of this world. And they, as we said, they have their wisdom too, but it's not the wisdom of God. Now, there's a lot of debate as to who's in view with these princes of this world. Is it referring uh, like in Psalm 2, to the kings of the earth. Uh, 
Uh, remember Psalm, Psalm 2 and verse 2, where it, it talks about this opposition uh, to the Lord and his Christ. And it talks about these, these rulers. Uh, Psalm 2, the kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. And so is it the prince of this world? Of course, in Acts 4, Peter uh, quotes that psalm and applies it to, to Pilate and to the Jewish leadership and, and talks about the princes of this world. So the, the big question is, is it really the kings of the earth that's in view? Merely human rulers who are applying their wisdom resulted in them crucifying the Lord of glory. Of course, that's what human wisdom did. Uh, it got it completely wrong concerning the Lord Jesus. It didn't believe his claims. It didn't believe his testimony, and it nailed him to a cross. That's what human wisdom did. So is that what's in view? Or is it, and some believe, that it goes beyond that, and it talks about Satan, who's the prince of the power of the air and his demonic forces. Now, we're going to think a little bit about that in a moment. Before we do, let's let's follow through on this. Is it the princes of this world, like the kings of the earth? They certainly didn't know what they were doing. They, they certainly were ignorant of God's great purpose at Calvary. They, they, it was lost on them. They didn't, they didn't get it. And we see again and again in Scripture that we have the testimony of how ignorant they really were. Uh, for instance, if you look at Acts chapter 3 and verse 17, Peter says, and now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. Did what? Well, verse 15, they killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And so now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it. They didn't realize what they were doing. They didn't realize, they didn't get it, who he was, why he had come. Uh, they, they didn't get those things. Acts 4, verse 25. Again, we've, we've already alluded to this, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? The people imagine vain things. Acts 4.25, the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for, to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel had determined before to be done but again did they they did it in ignorance another evidence that they did it in ignorance is in luke's gospel chapter 3 at 23 luke 23 when the lord jesus was on the cross he made this staggering statement about those that were doing this work to him it says in verse 34 of Luke 23, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. So he was echoing this truth that their ignorance, it didn't excuse their sin. But it, it's very evident that they, they didn't understand. Even though the Lord had presented tremendous evidence of who he was, the very miracles he did, uh, the words that he spoke, uh, they didn't get it. And so Peter, uh, I'm sorry, we're told by Paul here that and when not, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So there seems to be strong evidence that it's the rulers of this world. But there are still other Bible commentators that would say that it is a reference really to Satan the prince of the power of the air, uh, <clears throat> the prince of this world. Certainly his minions were involved uh, in whipping up the mob to crucify the son of God, thinking that it would defeat him. And it turned out to be the very opposite. He triumphed over them at the cross. Don't we remember that in Colossians, uh, the victory of Calvary. They didn't get that. If they'd known it, that it would in, in end in their defeat, it would signal their downfall, they wouldn't have crucified him either. The satanic forces, including Satan himself, did not understand God's great eternal plan. They understood from the Old Testament scriptures that the Son of God would be born, 
that he would die, but they couldn't grasp the full significance of the cross because these truths were hidden by God. In fact, it's now through the church that these truths are made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. These great lofty truths, these, these eternal mysteries. If you look at Ephesians 3 and verse 10, it's amazing that uh, we, we're instructing uh, these heavenly beings concerning the mystery. Uh, so just again, let me look at Ephesians 3 verse 9. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now to the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Isn't it amazing that the wisdom of God is being revealed to principalities and powers by the church? So what is it? Is it the human princes or is it the satanic forces behind them? Certainly in these early chapters, he's contrasting human wisdom with divine revelation. But let's just be honest. What is human wisdom? Who's behind human wisdom? Who's deceiving the nations? Is it not Satan? Remember when he's cast into the lake of fire, it says that he, that he should deceive the nations no more. And so I want to suggest to you that the answer is both. Yes, the human rulers, they crucified the Lord Jesus, but they were certainly being egged on by the principalities and powers, the, the rulers of the darkness of this present age. And in both cases, they were ignorant of the hidden wisdom of God at the cross. They thought it was the end of him. They thought it was the defeat of him and his purposes. And yet, actually, it was their defeat. And it was his triumph, him triumphing over them gloriously at the cross. Certainly, human wisdom is often influenced by the prince of the power of the air. Things like evolutionary theory, things like psychotherapy, where psychotherapy is, is undermining the sinfulness of sin. It's saying that, uh, that what people do is a medical condition uh, rather than a, a willful, sinful behavior. You see, who's behind all this? Uh, no question in my mind that behind so-called human wisdom is no one else but the prince of the power of the air. Another thing about this lovely verse uh, that we want to think about is that it reveals to us Christ's divinity. Paul calls him this lofty title. He says they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Well, what a wonderful title, the Lord of glory. And also we see his humanity because he was crucified. And he was crucified, not some spirit. He, he took on a human body, a body hast thou prepared me. Uh, he, he was crucified in a real body on a hard, real, cruel cross. And they're brought together by the apostle, leading to the conclusion that the one who was dying there on that center cross was none other than the Lord of glory, who bore our sins in his own body on that tree. And so God, the son, as incarnate in man, died on the cross. That's why Paul could say to the Ephesian elders, the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Yes, God manifest in flesh, dying on that center cross. It's good to know, too, that you, you have here. Uh, as we've already mentioned, that the wisdom of this world uh, and the prince of this world, verse 6, which come to nothing. It's temporary. There, that wisdom of the world is temporary. It's, it's, it's going to be, the day coming, it's going to be gone. On the other hand, God's eternal wisdom is from eternity to eternity. It's prevailing wisdom. And so we see on the one hand, the princes of this world. On the other hand, the Lord of glory. I'm reminded of other scriptures where, for instance, in Acts 7, 2, we read, 
the God of glory appeared unto Abraham. Back in Psalm 24, we've got who is this king of glory? He's the Lord of hosts. So you've got the God of glory, the king of glory, and now Paul calls the Lord Jesus the Lord of glory. What a beautiful title for our Savior. He's the Lord of glory, the Lord who came down from the glory, uh, the, the Lord of glory, and the one who is going to bring us to glory, bringing many sons to glory. And so what a wonderful Savior he is. So now verses 9 through 11, uh, we want to think of God's wisdom is known only by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the revealer, the teacher, the enlightener. Just as the Lord Jesus promised in John 14 through 16, he promised that he would send one who would lead us into all truth, who would bring things to the remembrance of the apostles, who would guide them. Uh, he's the teacher, the revealer. And so this section has great stress on the person of the Holy Spirit and his work in Revelation. And so you're going to see uh, the, the word spirit used over and over again. In verse 10, God has revealed them to us by his spirit, for the spirit searcheth all things. At the end of verse 11, uh, it says, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. And then verse 14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. And so there's tremendous emphasis on the person and work of the Holy Spirit in this little section. So it says in verse 9, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, this is a, a loose translation of Isaiah 64 uh, and verse 4. When I just turn there and read the Isaiah 64, 4 passage, this is why it says, as it is written. And so Paul is freely, if you like, translating this verse for us. It says in verse 4, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither have the eye seen, O God, beside thee, which he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. So that's the, the verse that is being quoted here from Isaiah 64, verse 4. And often you'll hear this verse quoted as referring to heaven. You know, so, so people will use it in terms of, see, I have not seen, hear, heard what was in for that, that God has prepared for them that love him. And we always think of this preparing the mansions in the glory and it's heaven that's in view. But clearly it can't be heaven that's in view, although certainly we're going to be staggered, I think, when we get to heaven. And there's certainly wonderful things that we will see. And of course, when we see the Lord Jesus, the first thing we'll say is the half has not been told me. However, Verse 10 shows God hath revealed them to us by his spirit. So it's things that God has revealed now that he's speaking of. Remember, it's these mysteries, these hidden things that, that had been hidden in previous ages, but they've now been revealed to us. Things that God has prepared for those that love him. And so we know now because God hath revealed them to us by his spirit. And so it's not a case of, future blessings in heaven but it's referring to the blessings we enjoy now in christ revealed to us by the spirit things that uh, have been kept before the world to our glory hidden but now revealed isn't it amazing that god had purposes for us to glorify us to, to to give glory to us to present glory to us in a marvelous way things that we could hardly understand uh, but these things are ours and revealed to us by the Spirit. In fact, God's plans for his own are so wonderful that our minds cannot begin to conceive of them or comprehend them, things that God has ordained for our glory, but he has now revealed them to us in the Scriptures. His eternal purpose for his people. 
And just as an example, isn't it a wonderful thing to have revealed that one day we're going to be like Christ, we're going to see him, we're going to be like him. That even now, he's working in us to make us more like him every single day. These are amazing things uh, that, that have been revealed to us. Tremendous truths. His eternal purposes for his people. And so he says, God hath revealed unto them, them unto us by his spirit. I want to just begin by referring this verse 10 to the doctrine of revelation. God hath revealed unto them unto us by his spirit it says the spirit searches all things yea the deep things of god and so this idea is it's he surveys he he searches out the deep things of god the holy spirit and then he reveals them to us now it tells us some wonderful things about the holy spirit his massive intellect uh, remember he's a real person he has he has uh, intellect, emotion, and will. He has emotion. He can be grieved. He has a will. The, the gifts are given as he wills. And he has this incredible intellect. And so because he's, he's a real person, but he's also a divine person. And so he searches out the deep things of God, surveys them, uh, looks through them, and then reveals them to us. What an amazing ministry the doctrine of revelation now of course uh, we know that there's different aspects of revelation there's natural revelation god revealing himself in creation uh, there's the revelation of scripture that is being spoken of here and then of course the final and ultimate revelation of god is seen in his son you've seen me you've seen the father the lord jesus would say to philip but god is in the business of revealing himself and here it's the the revelatory ministry of the spirit, revealing the deep things of God to us by his spirit. And so verse 11, it says, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So he's now using an analogy uh, from human nature. And again, it's, it's, some ways it's tied in a little bit with how greek philosophers thought they had a premise that like uh that, that like is known only by like so i'll give you an example if you have a pet dog you you can guess what your dog is thinking but you really don't know unless he could tell you <laughs> you might think you know but you don't really know well, even so, we could guess what God is thinking and try and guess about his wisdom, but we could, we could never know it unless he told us. And so it's the same as a, a human being. Nobody can fully know what, what I'm going on in my heart. I mean, you, you might guess, but you have no idea. You don't know what I'm thinking right now. Uh, so we, we can't know. But what we find here is, what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? So in other words, only I know what I'm really thinking right now. You can guess, but you're probably going to get it wrong. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Because the spirit of God not only is a real person, he's a divine person. And he knows and reveals to us the mind of God. No person outside of deity is intelligent as to the things of God, except the Spirit of God, who then reveals them to us. And isn't it a wonderful thing to know that God the Holy Spirit reveals to us the heart and mind of God? We would never figure it out. We would never guess it. But he has revealed these things to us by his Spirit. How thankful we should be this morning for the holy revealer who has revealed to us the deep things of God. Let us in to, to know something of the heart and mind of God that he has for his own, for his own people, the plans that he has for them, the, the thoughts that he has towards them. We, we could never figure it all out, but they've been revealed to us by the Spirit. So the, this doctrine of revelation. So how do we receive this wisdom in verse 12 and 13? It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, 
that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. If verse 10 is speaking of divine revelation, verse 12 is speaking of the illuminating work of the Spirit, what we call the doctrine of illumination. And so one of the purposes when we got saved in receiving the Holy Spirit at salvation is that God has basically put the author of this book inside of us. You know, sometimes if you read Shakespeare or uh, some of the uh, the old writings, and you'd, you'd love to just be able to say, what did you mean by that? I have no idea. I, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I'm so far removed. I, I, I can't get this. And yet we can ask the Spirit of God who lives within us to show us the meaning of Scripture. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I'm sure you have where you're reading a passage of scripture and something you've never seen before. And all of a sudden it's like the lights go on. That's the idea of illumination, the spirit of God revealing truth to us. And wow, I never saw that before. And it's just like a light bulb goes on. And so that's the idea of receiving the Holy Spirit. It was given, to, he was given to us to, to discern the mind of deity, to grasp the things that are freely given to us of god by the way isn't it wonderful that the things that are freely given to us of god god has freely given to us so many gifts every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the father of lights in whom there's no variation variableness nor shadow of turning wonderful isn't it? god's a giver and one of the things he's given to us freely is the spirit so that we might understand the divine revelation and that the lights might go on and that we might understand divine truth every believer has received the spirit who is from god every believer has access to this spiritual wisdom in the word of god because we have the teacher spirit of god my teacher be showing the things of christ to me now, it doesn't mean that every believer has equal spiritual wisdom. But it does mean that we're capable now, through the help of the Holy Spirit, of understanding all spiritual mysteries. We're, we're, we have the, the teacher to help us, and it's a wonderful thing. And again, are we, are we availing ourselves of this wonderful revelation? So we've thought about revelation. We thought about the illuminating work of the spirit. We want to think now about inspiration, how this, this divine message of the spirit was brought to us in the scriptures. And so he, he says in verse 13, which things also we speak, speaking of the apostles, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but that which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Some translations have the idea of communicating spiritual truths in spiritual words. And so the apostles, when they spoke, were given the, the teachings of the Holy Spirit revealed in words directed by him, communicating spiritual things in spiritual words and so all the, the, these words of scripture that are given to us they're given by inspiration of the scriptures holy men of god spake as they were moved by the holy spirit it wasn't that they they put things in their words although he certainly used their style and their personality but the holy spirit of god like the wind in the sails of a ship uh, it says they were moved, they were borne along by the Holy Spirit. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And this is the doctrine of inspiration that is found here in this verse. Spiritual truths that come from God combined with spiritual words that were given to the apostles and they convey God's revelation to man. They're inspired they're infallible because God, the Holy Spirit, was the one who moved these men. They're without error and they're powerful because they're words that are not the words of human wisdom, 
or which man's wisdom teaches, but the Holy Ghost teaches. And so what a wonderful thing to have the Spirit of God revealing the deep things of God to us, illuminating the things of God to us, turning the lights on so we can understand it, and then uh, inspiring the apostles to carefully record these truths, even down to the very words, so that we might understand them. Oh, how blessed we are to have this revelation. Now, verse 14 through 16, he wants to talk about the natural man and the spiritual man. So he's he talks about the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, maybe I should just point out that the word discerned in verse 14 and judgeth in verse 15, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. And then the word judged, yet he himself is judged of no man, is all a translation of the, the exact same Greek word. And so as we consider this verse, he says, the natural man. Who is the, the natural man? Well, he's, he's the, the unsaved man. Um, the, the ancient Greek word for it has the idea of a materialist, uh, one who lives as if there was nothing beyond the physical life. He's the natural man, uh, kind of similar to the animals, just concerned with the, uh, the basic necessities of life. He's the natural man. Uh, he, he's a materialistic in worldview. It, it's where we all start. We all start as natural man, uh, that life inherited from Adam, the unregenerate regenerate man, the unsaved man. And no matter how smart he is, it says he, he can't receive the things of the spirit of God. Their foolishness, they don't make sense to him. Uh, he could have the, the most incredible intellect on the planet. And as he looks at the word of God, he just can't get it. It's beyond him. Education is not the answer. Regeneration is the answer. You must be born again. You must, you must become like a little child and be converted. And under, to understand the word of God, to understand the great mysteries of God, the natural man can't get it. He, he doesn't receive the things of the spirit. They're, they're foolishness to him. He, he would say, why waste you? It's like men like, like Bill Gates. Uh, to him, going to church is a waste of time. I could be making money. I, I could be whatever. Uh, and the natural man, he, he just, spiritual things make no sense to him. He could either be having fun or making money or whatever. He just doesn't get it. He doesn't get the value of, of these great spiritual realities. All education does is make clever devils out of devils. <laughs> but regeneration makes sinners into saints and scholars <laughs> and isn't it wonderful oh how glad we are that we we uh, i don't have any degrees but i have a ba after my name mike atwood born again <laughs> and and that's where divine wisdom comes right it's it's being born again having the spirit of god coming to live within you and giving you insights into spiritual things. The natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God, their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. He can't figure them out. He can't make them out. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. So what does this, this mean? He that is spiritual or the, the, the Christian, the one who has received the spirit of God, he can discern, he can judge, uh, he, he, he can see things through his spiritual eyes, uh, but he's judged by no man. Uh, it doesn't mean, what, what that means is not that they can't judge a believer for their failings, they do that all the time. But what it really means is that he can't weigh him up. He cannot fathom. The unsaved man cannot fathom the spiritual man. Christians are, are a riddle, an enigma to them. They just can't figure, they, don't, they can't understand what makes us tick. Why, we would, why would we spend uh, hours uh, at a meeting, uh, of, you know, especially on a beautiful sunny day and uh, and a warm day in Canada. And why would you spend all morning with the saints? Why would you do that? Why just listening to somebody talk from the Bible? They, they just can't figure this stuff out. It, it, we're a total enigma to them. 
So it says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? That he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now, I want to just, it's a wonderful verse to end this little section on. Uh, it's a quotation again from Isaiah. Uh, Paul loved the book of Isaiah, and he quotes from it very frequently. Uh, in fact, uh, it's an interesting exercise to read through Isaiah and, and try and see if you can spot verses that Paul quotes from. And they're numerous. Uh, he absolutely loved Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah 40, verse 13, Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? Who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? And then he says, we have the mind of Christ. So what does he mean here? First of all, it gives us some evidence of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, taught him. Uh, we have the mind of Christ. It's just, again, a strong inference that the Lord Jesus is indeed a divine person. And so wonderful to know that he is a divine person. And so he that is spiritual... Uh, the, the true Christian, uh, who hath known the mind of the Lord, we have the mind of Christ. How do we have the mind of Christ? Well, it's revealed to us in the word of God, in words given to us by the spirit of God. That's why we have the mind of Christ or the mind of God. We, we, we know his heart and his mind because it's revealed to us in the scriptures. Now, it's not saying that we're infallible or anything like that, but it's just telling us that because we have this amazing divine revelation, which is a wonderful thing that, that has been given to us, uh, what, what that really means is uh, we look at life now from the Savior's point of view. Because we're regenerated, because we have the instructions and the guidance of the Word of God, we can now look at things from the mind of Christ, from his point of view, his values, his desire, his mind is revealed to us in the word of God. It means well, we can think God's thoughts, not as the world thinks, but as God views things. Biblical spirituality is a mindset, a way of viewing life, which comes from welcoming the things of God by means of his word. And so as we understand the word of God, we, we, we understand how God thinks about things, the mind of Christ. And so by way of application, as we wrap up this morning, how thankful are we for divine revelation, for divine illumination, for divine inspiration? Aren't you thankful that you have the spirit of God living within you and the word of God in your hands? And again, we owe a great debt. Yeah. I, Men like William Tyndale, uh, and then that uh, John Wycliffe, that literally gave their lives so that we could have access to this wisdom that the world doesn't get, this wisdom that is from God. And so how thankful we are for the word of God, for the spirit of God. And of course, the, the full revelation that it brings us to see Christ, which is a wonderful thing. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 5, Paul asked the question, is there not a wise man among you? There's a great need for spirit-taught men who through meditation and study of the word of God can apply the mind of Christ to different situations we face in our day. There were problems in the assembly of, in Corinth they were going to the law courts. What were they doing? They were going to worldly wisdom to solve their problems. And Paul says, is there not a wise man amongst you? Can you not discern the mind of Christ from the word of God and apply it to that situation? And so how we need today spirit-taught men, men who are instructed by the spirit of God, who meditate long on the scriptures and know the times and know how to act and apply the word of God to the circumstances of life. And then the third thing just to say is this, human cleverness never found out God. If you want to, I'm not assuming that everybody's going to be listening to me this morning is a true believer. And if you really want to understand the Bible, 
The first place is the Lord Jesus says you must become like a little child and be converted. See yourself as a sinner who desperately needs a savior and call upon the Lord Jesus who died on the cross that he might save you from the penalty of sin. Ask him to be your savior. And if you do that, then something wonderful will happen to you. One of, the, one of the many, many wonderful things that will happen to you is that the Spirit of God will come take up residence in your life. And all of a sudden, the Bible that makes no sense to you will suddenly begin to make sense because the teacher living within you is the author of the book. Spirit of God, my teacher be revealing the things of Christ to me. May God encourage you from his holy word this morning. Amen.